Okay, very good morning to you. It is Wednesday the 3rd of February. Hope you're doing well. Let's get straight to it and talk about this guy here. Jeff Bezos came out last night, bit of a surprise announcement with the Amazon corporate earnings and said he's gonna step aside as the Amazon CEO. So gonna talk a little bit about that. What's my view? Um, why has he done it? What does this mean for the company? How can we expect their share price to perform as it goes through the session going forward? Uh, and then also to update you on a few other things, Alphabet had really spectacular earnings last night. They're trading up over 7% in aftermarket trade. Uh, Mario Draghi confirmed from reports in the Italian press at the weekend that he's tipped to become the new Italian prime minister, but a few key obstacles he needs he needs to hurdle first. Then we've got an update on the Oxford Astra vaccine and the idea about the efficacy rates over a two dosage shot uh, in terms of some more positive news. And then we've got API inventories and then just generally the day ahead. So quick look at the overall market sentiment here at the open. And uh, the dollar still holding on to some relative gains that we've been seeing over the last two sessions. So the Dixie is uh, up about one tenth of one percent, albeit just off the highs that we printed yesterday. So the major pairs still trading a little heavy. Euro dollar here, top left as I'm speaking, just touching fresh session lows for the moment. Uh, again, technically, I'd be keeping an eye just down toward the lows that we've had before. And if we look on the daily chart, you know, we, we do start to bring in some fairly meaningful levels when we start talking about 120, which has always been a, a relative symbolic level for the ECB in terms of um, their overall perception of euro strength. Um, and in this case, coming back down, that would be a key area of support to have a look at. Yesterday's low uh, that we're seeing late in the evening amid the kind of uh, short term dollar strength we've been seeing that would come in around 120.27 in the futures. Uh, on the upside, top end of the range, a decent area of resistance seen at the pivot, which would also be yesterday afternoon's high at around that 120.58. Uh, so cable just backing off a little bit as well, but these major pairs down only moderately so, about 10 pips. Elsewhere, stock index futures positive again. DAX future knocking on the door of what was the overnight Asia Pacific session high here in the center left. Uh, this comes after positive closes were seen on Wall Street. We closed up 1.4% um, for the S&P, 1.6% roughly so for the Dow and the NASDAQ 100 last night. This was before then these mega uh, cap tech earnings came out. Otherwise elsewhere, um, T-notes broadly flat down just a tick and WTI crude uh, has had uh, an interesting session or so, uh, just keeping an eye on the price action here. Um, generally, price is very elevated. Uh, as we saw yesterday, we did close above a very meaningful level here from a technical perspective, which was going back to the 20th of Feb of 2020. So one year high, more so uh, here for crude. Uh, and technically speaking on the upside, there is a bit of clean air until we get further up really towards price levels we weren't seeing until the beginning of last year. Uh, up at around 56.27 and it comes after some bullish data we had from the API inventories ahead of the DOEs we'll get later on today. But look, let's talk Amazon. Let's get you up to speed on what's going on. And the numbers, let's talk about the numbers for Amazon first because they were pretty spectacular as have really all of these big tech stocks from Microsoft to Apple to uh, Alphabet and Amazon. You know, they these companies during this pandemic environment have really taken it to a whole new level and obviously revenue wise breaching this kind of milestone $100 billion figure. So their revenues were $125.56 billion for the quarter, higher than expectations of 119 spot seven. Operating income 6.9 billion, uh, a CQ1 net sales in a range basically um, around 106 to 110. Expectations were for just 95.7 billion. So they're very bullish about the future. Their EPS was more than pretty much double consensus, came in at 14.09. Uh, and actually watching their share price, um, when the initial news came out about Bezos, their shares were a little bit mixed. I was watching the aftermarket activity and their shares initially dropped came back positive and then they were kind of flatlining. And then the company came out on the conference call and said that COVID expenses in Q1 will drop to 2 billion from 4 billion uh, in Q4, mostly seen 
due to the fact that warehouses are less busy than what they were during the holiday quarter, which makes sense. So there's less cost implications of PPE and keeping the workers safe in warehouses. Uh, and that's quite a, that was a dramatic headwind for the company previously. So that being eliminated out is another net positive as well. And their shares actually moved a little high in aftermarket trade when that comment came out. But look, let's talk about Bezos and you know what is going on because this wasn't exactly a scheduled announcement. And I guess you know when we have these kind of significant companies like this um, of magnitude and also notoriety in terms of their leadership in the form of their CEO. I mean, Bezos is the guy that was obviously there in his garage selling books back in the 90s and to take it to this uh, kind of monster-sized company now, obviously there's going to be a little bit of initial uh, interpretation of just apprehension. What does this mean? It's going to lose its real spearhead, its driving force. But you know, I think any sensible CEO would be aware of this factor and the transition process would have been smooth. The delegation of, of responsibility and strategy decision making would have been spread in order to take away from yourself. You would definitely not want to put yourself in the situation, kind of like what Elon Musk has done, where I think if Elon Musk got run over by a bus tomorrow, I'm afraid Tesla's shares would get absolutely decimated. Um, any other sensible CEO would rather do the complete opposite, which is as good as it is to be this PR machine that Musk is. And un undoubtedly, he's, he is the driving force that's created this phenomenal story that is Tesla. But in terms of longevity, it does create significant risks. <laughs> you probably saw yesterday Musk is taking a break from Twitter We'll see how long that lasts. I think last time he said he was taking a break on Twitter, it lasted literally a couple of days before he had a pop shot at, guess who? Jeff Bezos and Amazon. So I don't believe that for a second. Um, but Bezos is going to step aside. Uh, he'll transition to the role of executive chair. So this is point one that I think is um, good to understand. Executive chair is still pretty involved still pretty hands-on. I mean, the difference here from a definition point of view, the CEO's kind of implementation, running of the strategy, ultimate line of responsibility, but the responsibility to the board of directors really lies with the executive chair. And so he would still preside over the company's general stability and so on. And he has said himself that he'll continue to remain quite active in the business. So again, it's kind of a, it's not like he's completely removed and off he goes. Um, he, he still definitely will be there. Um, but overall, who's going to be, I guess, the biggest question, who's going to be his replacement? Well, it's a guy called Andy Jassy. Now, those who follow the Amazon stock will be very familiar with Andy because he's a long time uh, kind of member of the, the Amazon family. He was one of the first kind of more technical assistants that Bezos took on back in the late 90s. I believe he joined the firm in 1997. He is currently and has been the longtime CEO of the um, Amazon Web Services and Amazon's cloud computing business. Now that will be meaningful for many of you because that is really the real dominant growth area of this company, AWS. So it's a very assured, safe, recognized, consistent pair of hands for the company to be moving over to, to Andy Jassy. What has Bezos said in terms of his rationale? Um, he said, as executive chair, I'll still be engaged in important Amazon initiatives. He also will have the time and energy to focus on other things. And the things he noted were day one fund, the Bezos Earth Fund, Blue Origin, the Washington Post, and many other passions. And actually, that latter one, talking of the Washington Post, that is something which I think is quite meaningful because he has... Uh, so many other business interests. Some of them, like the Washington Post, start to venture in into, say, uh, global politics. Um, Bezos was someone who ran and clashed with the previous US President Donald Trump. And if you remember, um, the US President uh, and administration decided to go with Microsoft for the $10 billion Jedi project with the Pentagon. That was a big blow for Amazon and a big win for Microsoft at the time. And a lot of that being a kind of indirect impact of the fact that obviously Bezos through his publications has been quite critical of the administration. He's had similar situations with Amazon's growth in India and the existing government and how they've dealt with various domestic issues. So it does make some sense in that respect for him to step away. Um, you know, I guess 
you know, when you're one of the world's richest men, what really drives you, motivates you? I mean, making a hundred billion dollars is a nice, you know, kind of symbolic thing to leave on, I would say. Um, you know, when someone was to say to you, I know it sounds crazy, but hey, Jeff, how do you feel about shooting for 200 billion quarter? I mean, Amazon will print a 200 billion dollar revenue quarter in the future. I have absolutely zero doubt in my mind. But how much of a motivator would that be for someone like, you know, Bezos? It's kind of like that prospect theory curve. The payoff is getting ever lesser the bigger it gets. So I don't think there's much motivation there. Whereas things like, you know, the Blue Origin Fund, things like that are significantly behind uh, some of the initiatives being led by Elon Musk. And I think that's the type of stuff that really drives these guys is competing in these other areas beyond their own kind of core business in that respect. You know, the guys got divorced recently. That obviously was a big hit, not just financially, I'm sure emotionally as well. So, you know, I can understand lots of different reasons of why this might have taken place. Um, so yeah, that, that's my overall kind of view on things. Um, I think for the stock price in itself for Amazon shares, I mean, look, this is what Amazon did overnight. And in fact, Amazon pretty much flatlined. So as sensational as the headline sounds, the stock price really so far in the aftermarket trade, the initial perception hasn't been a massive negative as what I guess assumptions would have been. Obviously, we'll wait for the market open today, see how it performs, but it'll be indicative then of generally that uh, this would be relatively smooth, orderly transition of power. Again, I definitely don't see this as an as a as an Elon Musk situation. If this was talking Tesla and he just walked away for whatever reason, this chart would look radically different. Uh, but I think the the strategy from from Bezos and the transition to Jesse will be a relatively smooth one. The other one after market was Alphabet. You can see here huge jump in their share price in after market trade. So they went up around seven point four percent and extended hours. Their revenue is 56.9 billion, firmer than expected. Operating margins at 28%, operating income 15.65 billion, EPS at 22.30 against 15.58. The, what basically underpinned this phenomenal print of numbers from, from Alphabet was heavy digital advertising spend during the holiday season. As you can imagine, the company really making huge steps forward in, in those figures mainly based on the fact of COVID-19 and that many businesses now are having to pivot away off traditional kind of high street physical um, retail selling into the online format. And so bringing in new participants as well as those ramping up their budgets to try and tap into uh, this competitive online space when everyone's um, experiencing restrictions at the moment due to COVID. Uh, YouTube ad revenue also jumped nearly 50% as well on the back of that 6.9 billion um, against expectations of 6.2 billion. So that's your kind of earnings summary. A quick look elsewhere, he's back. Yeah, Mario Draghi, Super Mario, back in the hot seat. Uh, we've talked about this a lot in my notes on Sunday and our briefing on Monday. So it's not the most unexpected news, but yeah, Italy's president has asked Mario Draghi, the former ECB president, to come back and begin talks to form or look to form a new Italian government. Overall take here is that, you know, the guy has a nickname of Super Mario for, for one clear reason. He's, you know, he used to throw everything in the kitchen sink during the sovereign crisis and when he was steering the ship at the ECB. Um, he is an extremely smooth operator, uh, incredibly well experienced. He's very well respected in markets. He is a very safe pair of hands. Um, particularly in a situation as unstable as the Italian political environment at the moment. So uh, a technocrat government could well be the solution that's needed, really, given the disharmony and the, the, the kind of split and fragmentation of Italian uh, politics at the moment. However, it's definitely not going to be absolutely plain sailing because there is a few things here. Um, the senior politician in Italy's five-star movement has said already that they would not support a, a draggy led government. And some of the things I was reading this morning in the Politico were suggesting then that that's difficult because then he needs to create numbers from somewhere and that might either come from either uh, the PD or the Forza Italia. So he's got to look to bring in some of these other parties which could then bring 
a degree of apprehension amongst the existing other coalition members uh, who might not want to participate in a government sharing power in such a way. So, yeah, definitely to keep an eye on. I'd be interested to see, well, actually, let's have a look at BTPs. I mean, look at the reaction in BTPs this morning. Whew. Big, big pop gap up in BTP. It's Italian bond futures here. So you can see uh, yields just sinking on the back of Draghi being more formally tipped now as potentially the next Italian PM if he can club together this government. Um, so the idea here being then is that this is the market saying that you know they would love Draghi to bring a little bit of um, an adult in the room, restore a bit of calmness and, and order into the Italian system at the moment and what otherwise has been a degree of political instability. Okay, elsewhere, um, just want to have a quick word on this. Oxford Astra study. Um, you know, another good news, actually, for the UK. I mean, the UK has done a, a pretty uh, phenomenal job, of course, of, of getting up and running. And, you know, they were um, administering almost 600,000 uh, doses in one day just a few days ago. So they continue to close in on this mid-Feb target. I must say that it doesn't mean, though, that they're going to re loosen restrictions at that point in time. You know, lots of conversation at the moment um, about new variants on the variants, if you like, whether it be in UK or elsewhere. And so, you know, the virus is mutating as viruses do. And this does pose then considerable risk, risk then to a new transmission of the virus uh, and also then the, the effectiveness of the vaccines in themselves. So. Definitely, it's not just about hitting target and it's game over. This thing is going to be very long and protracted, in my view, in terms of the reopening of any of these economies from fairly stringent lockdowns. But the vaccine update here that's positive is a single dose of the Oxford Astra coronavirus vaccine is 75% effective from three weeks to 12 weeks after the injection according to analysis of trial data, and then the vaccine efficacy rose to 82.4% following a second dose administered then at the 12-week marker. So this is very important because the UK, remember a few weeks ago, took the strategy approach of rather than just administering dose one, come back, dose two, move on, next person, please. What they've gone down to was the efficacy rate is strong enough um, to buy us time to administer as many people as possible in a 12 up to 12 week period and then we'll start administering the second shots and this data would suggest then that, that that was a very good decision that the UK government has made and in order to then ramp up and get as many people inoculated as possible which is going to be obviously very productive in trying to contain the virus and its transmission at this point. Otherwise, elsewhere, WTI crude obviously moved to a one-year high uh, yesterday. Uh, I, we briefly looked at the chart. There's some really interesting levels on the upside, which could open a bit of a door to, to a further push, uh, particularly under this type of uh, vaccine news, equities. You know, NASDAQ's just a whisker off session high or all-time highs again. The S&P's fully recovered last Wednesday sell-off on that kind of reported liquidation of some of the hedge fund positions in these short squeeze stocks. Uh, that's that ship has sailed if you like um gme gamestop they would they got hammered again yesterday all of those companies pretty much getting getting crushed uh, and silver's backed off more than closed the gap and we're trading down below 27 uh, in silver futures this morning so that that ship has sailed now as far as markets are concerned um, but in terms of the APIs last night, head of the DOEs later, uh, a, a bullish figure, which is only going to help the kind of oil picture at the moment with the technical moves above what we saw yesterday, meaningful levels on the longer term uh, charts. Uh, the headline draw was 4.261 million, uh, almost more than double consensus. Cushing draw 1.885, gasoline draw 240,000. So uh, we'll be looking at those numbers as reference points for later on today. Then as far as the, the session is concerned, we've had some Chinese data overnight. It's not really um, that important, to be honest, albeit their service PMI at 52 against expectations of 55.5, which was the lowest since April of 2020. But nonetheless, the market's just not, not that focused on, 
uh, those figures at the moment and obviously still above the key expansionary level of 50 for the time being. You've got the service PMIs coming out this morning. Uh, these are all final readings, so unlikely to be market moving, but what will be of interest is the HICP flash readings, so inflation figures coming out of the Eurozone at 10 o'clock, worth watching if you're looking at things like the Euro currency. Then this afternoon, ISM um, services PMI, you've got ADP national employment as well, so you know some of these jobs related figures or constituents in ISM will be key as to then form our idea of what the labour report will look like from the US government department on Friday in non-farms. DOE's 3.30 um, and speaker wise you've got a lot of Fed speakers actually today but they don't really kick off until US trading hours with 1.30 Fed's Kashkari uh, you've got Bullard, Harker, Mester, Evans but between Kashkari and Mester you've pretty much got the absolute full spectrum of FOMC um, perspective from dovish Kashkari to hawkish Mester. So it'd be interesting to see what they've got to say. I must stress though that only one of these five Fed speakers are voters and that being Fed's Evans, who's the last one up on the docket and doesn't speak until aftermarket, just a point of note. Earnings wise today, uh, what have we got? Well, from the US pre-market, couple of interesting smaller names perhaps on a single stock basis, Spotify, uh, Biogen, Aftermarket, Qualcomm, eBay, uh, but no one I'd say impactful from an index trading uh, perspective. All right, that is it. Gonna let you get on with the day. Um, any questions at all, feel free to drop me a comment and uh, happy to help. All right, thanks guys, have a good day.